pest control becomes a really big significant piece of that. The damage and the inconvenience it can cause if you have a, the chewing through wires or the, the constant uh, having to negate them from getting into feed and things as well. Um, it, it is, it's the economic and also the, the, the labour, the time that goes into the management of that too. Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I am your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with beef industry experts and leaders to improve your own operation. Speaking of improving operations, I'd like to personally invite you to attend my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are Q&A calls between cattle producers and industry experts that allow you as the cattle producer to enter a community of people who support and push you to find those improvements and connect with experts who can answer your questions and guide you in the right direction. You can find out more about these events and how to sign up by heading over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. And while you're there, if you sign up for my newsletter, I'll send you 22 ranch management tips for free that have been shared by the gurus who have been on my show before. Remember, the best way to support podcasts is to share, rate, and review the show so that I know what episodes and content you like and want more of. With that, let's connect you with this week's guest and expert. All righty. Well, Jeff and Adam, I am excited to have you on the show today. Um, you two are both new to the show, and we're going to be talking about a new topic because I have not actually talked about rodent management before, but I know I personally do not appreciate them when I see them on my place. So I'm excited to hear about some of the solutions that uh, you guys can offer to myself and the listeners today. So thank you for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us indeed. All right. So we're going to kind of jump right into it. And so Jeff, how about you kind of share what are some of the main challenges that farmers and ranchers face with rodents on their operations? What does that look like? Yeah. So um, rodents are small animals, right? But they can cause uh, significant damage. They can damage your, your home, your property, your equipment. Another thing with them is that they, they reproduce rapidly so they can cost thousands of dollars in damages and extermination costs if it gets to that point. Um, when you look at them, as far as the home and the ranch, one thing that they can do is they can, they can ruin some equipment. So they can uh, chew on wires and uh, even possibly start fires by chewing through those, those wires. They can spoil food. Um, and then from a, a feed perspective, they can contaminate, contaminate uh, large quantities of feed with their droppings and urine. And then if you have a garden or something like that along uh, your property, they can eat vegetables and fruit and they can, they can damage your lawn by digging holes and tunnels. So they can do a lot of different types of damage to your property. So that's one way, um, you know, they kind of are a nuisance is that, that damage and, and the economic aspect that goes with that. But they can also uh, carry disease. So they can, uh, in addition to that, host fleas and ticks, uh, which carry Lyme and other diseases. So it's an economic piece that, you know, they're, they're causing uh, physical damage. But then the thing that you can't really see all the time is, is the health uh, damage that they're causing uh, through disease. Yeah, and those are all very relevant and important topics to keep in mind. Adam, do you have anything you kind of want to add as far as what negative impacts rodents are having on farms and ranches today? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good covering actually from Jeff. It is that it's the the, the economic piece, obviously, with the, the running of a farm is obviously uh, lots of time is required to do that and labor. So um, anything that's dragging um, people away from that, I think, is becomes another added task to have to look after. So pest control becomes a really big significant piece of that. The damage and the inconvenience it can cause if you have a the chewing through wires or the, the constant uh, having to negate them from getting into feed and things as well. Um, it, it is, it's the economic and also the, the, the labor, the time that goes into the management of that too, a, a real inconvenience. Uh, a big one for us is also the, the biodiversity challenge that it has as well. It has a 
an impact on native wildlife as well, which has uh, always been close to our hearts of good nature. It's something um, that's sort of part of our ethos. So we see that um, changing over time and, and maybe the way that we do things a little bit differently as well as part of that. So Adam, do you kind of want to talk about you know, what industry in, you're in, what is good nature, what does your role look like today? Yeah, we'd love to. So um, we essentially started out as a, 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 a pest control tool in the world of conservation. Um, that's something that's really important to us and dear to us, the people that turn up to our business uh, all the time are here to make the, make the world a better place. But what we've found in doing that, a, a, a pest control, a trap that was resetting, um, was constantly available. We needed to tick some certain boxes to make it um, apply in the conservation world. Those were having it toxin free, um, having it to be able to reset and making sure that the kills, when it did kill, that it was humane. What we've found though, and as the, the brand and our product is, has evolved, is that actually we, we solved some really uh, unique problems in the rural space. Um, and what was the problem we were solving in conservation is actually even just as applicable in the, in the rural setting. So um, I guess for us, the, the, the big one is that we can remove the use of toxin on a, on a farm, which is a, an increasing social conversation that's, that's coming up. Um, and, you know, and some of the, the challenges that come along the use of toxin of, of it being, it can be eaten, but it can still take 24 to 48 hours for the, the pest species to die after chewing that, the rat or the mouse. Um, and of course, they can still cause that damage in that time frame that they're in there. They can still chew on wires. And most importantly, they can also still breed within that time frame. So to make a dent in a rodent population, you really need to kill as fast as or faster than the actual uh, the rat can breed. Otherwise, you're just sort of band-aiding the issue. So to have something that can reset consistently and actually get through breeding pairs becomes really important um, to make a dent in a rodent network. Um, and I think the, the addition that it's to this removing some toxin and it's a, it's a humane death as well seems to fit and cater for some really interesting um, conversations in the, in the rural space. Um, as part of that has been our, our coming on board with Gallagher, who are obviously a, a, an expert in the, in the um, rural um, egg space. So for us, it was a natural partnership to, to come on board um, and see how we can uh, lead that conversation um, moving forward. Well, thank you for that explanation about what you do and who good nature is. And uh, Jeff, I believe I kind of skipped over introducing you too. So would you please talk about, you know, your role in um, this space and how you fit onto this topic for the show, please? Yeah, so I'm uh, with Gallagher Animal Management. I've been with the company since about February of this year. I'm part of the North American product management team. So what I do is I help maintain our current products, but also help bring on new products to the market. So we look at companies like Good Nature, where we think, um, you know, they're doing some great things and have a great product and um, see some applicability in our market. So we, we bring them on as a partner. We've been really happy with uh, bringing Good Nature on since uh, July of, of this year in the North American market. Well, awesome. Thank you. So let's dive into, you know, how these traps work. Adam, you talked about how they're non-toxic but they're very effective in killing the rodent right away so you can you kind of can either one of you one of you i guess talk through the process of how these traps work and i will link um a video or a website page in the show notes for people to view but can you talk through that process please yeah absolutely i've actually i've got a something i prepared earlier as well but i thought i'd bring in a we've got a, a cut trap which is always a nice way to actually talk and show the how the the, the trap forms and what it's actually doing so the trap can be set on, a, and I'm sure it'll be seen in your link, but it could be set onto a, a, an actual mount here itself and set like so onto a fence post or the outside of a, a shed or the area you're looking to um, to have that control. It could also comes with a, a tree mount, sorry, a trap stand too. So it could be set on an angle and moved around for internal use in uh, roof cavities or in a shed or wherever you might be looking to have control also. So essentially with the, it's powered by a CO2 unit. So that um, ties into there. This is obviously one that's cut open in half so you can see actually how it performs. We we have here is an actual a bolt that fires and we have this little silver thing which you can see there that's for a leaf trigger that is actually the thing that will actually dump the gas that sits in here the co2 to fire the trap to get the actual the strike a big piece of our tech actually which is often overlooked is where the lure itself so we have the um the paste here that comes into in, a, in its own form and this is uh, engaged you take off a, a 
the, the piece here, 10 cent piece there, which actually starts a magnet. You can hear that click as you take it on and off. And that actually starts, this is uh, inside here is the, the paste that we're using to attract the, the, um, the rat to the actual, to the tracker. Okay. That'll start inflating over time and it's over for six months. So it sits inside this, this cap here, which sits on top of the track. And as it inflates and expands slowly, the pressure of being in the shroud cap here means that we know that over six months time, the lure will keep dropping down consistently um, to keep it constantly um, available, but also co constantly attractive as well. So the, uh, the rat or the mouse comes to look for that smell. It can smell it comes from up here and comes up to get it. As it does, it goes past this to get to the, the actual uh, paste itself and that will fire that and then it resets again. And um, with the CO2 canister itself, you get 24 kills um, and then you can do in the, the lure for six months. So essentially, once you get a, a unit, you get six months of that constant control. If you go through more than 20 fill kills in that time, you obviously will have a lot of activity, but um, you're in the position where you can get another CO2 canister to top it up. Um, or you, you know, we often say in that situation, it's a good chance to get it. You probably need another trap if you've got that much activity on your in the area you're trying to protect as well. So you said that takes care of rats and mice? Yes, it does, yeah. So then um, that is there a counter on it too that kind of tells you where you're at with how many strikes? Because you said there's what, 24 strikes available with that CO2 cartridge? Yeah, there absolutely there is. So there's a, that counter comes on in our, um, our original product that sits onto the sexual canister itself and will count the kills for it. There's, there's two reasons behind that one as you articulated is that it's to sort of count the amount of kill activity you've had so you know when you might need to replace your CO2 canister. The other one is because scavenging is a real thing with uh, with the use of these traps. So it essentially becomes a bit of a feeding station for nature. So um, often you'll have, we know of other rats are the biggest eaters of other rats. So they'll come and drag their friend away and then actually go and uh, find, go back to the trap to put their own selves into the, into the line of fire as well. Um, we know that the likes of cats will, uh, will come along and actually look under these. Eventually, it becomes a bit of a habitual process, and they'll, they know that actually, well, if I go to this trap, I find there's a, a rat sitting underneath that or a mouse for me to eat. Of course, because it's all toxin-free, the, there's no secondary poisoning as well, which uh, we know is a really big part of the um, of our success in, in the rural space too, especially around livestock and with, with dogs and pets as well. Um, so that then keeps the count of it. Our new product that we have to bring into market as well through Gallagher is uh, talks to a, an app as well. So your phone will collect all of that information for you. It gives us a lot more, um, I guess, visibility and ability to also help with the, getting the trap set up correctly, but also we're able to then give um, hints and feedback and, and talk to the consumer directly to say, hey, look, you're, you've had your lure for this long. You've had it out for five months now. You probably do a top up. Um, so you can go into your local retailer and, and go ahead and actually get another lure. Also counts those kills. And when you actually go up and touch your phone onto it, it'll give you a timestamp, it'll heat stamp it and date it as well, which becomes, it just starts collating information of when you're getting the kills, how frequently, um, and also we can start um, identifying trends within the farm. So if you're seeing every Tuesday morning at 7 a.m., you're starting to get kills coming on again and again every week, you can start looking at the practices of what you might be doing on the farm to actually um, but is actually making those happen as well. So it becomes a really important reporting tool too and just gives a lot more visibility and assurance to the user that the trap is working, how it's working and when it's working too, which can um, yeah, help identify some extra challenges. Hey folks, it's Shay here and I want to personally invite you as my listener to take the next steps in improving the profitability of your operation by signing up for my 2023 Rancher Mind series. The Rancher Mind program consists of producer-driven monthly calls that cover topics such as developing a reproduction program, labor challenges, cattle marketing, business development, and goal setting. I bring on industry experts each month to answer your specific questions. I also provide extra resources and a place for you to keep networking and moving forward without requiring you to leave the ranch. For more information, head over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com, and select the Rancher Mind event tab. Let's keep moving individual operations and our industry forward. Well, that is pretty high-tech uh, rodent management compared to anything I'm used to, but it's, it's very interesting. I appreciate that. And uh, I think the pet friendly standpoint is really important because so many farms and ranches do have 
barn cats and cattle dogs around. And I know that's something my family has always kept in mind when we do have um, any rodent issues, or it seems like a higher population is like, well, how do we keep the dog safe as well? So where do you recommend placing these? Like, are there, what are like the good or bad areas to place these traps to, for better success? Yeah, so it's part of the, the system for us is that we want to set up an actual trapping system. Um, so when you buy one of our kits, you get the, the lure, the CO2, a trap stand, a tree mount. It's all ready to go for six months of, of trapping. The first part of it is getting the trap in the right place. So we have these that come with it too. Um, this is a, a, a trap locator card, essentially. Um, and by you get three or four of these and you put them around different locations. Um, what we know often people will do with, with pest control, well, they know the hot spots. There's a, there's a compost heap, there's a chicken coop. They, they assume they've seen the rats there. Um, it might be at the bottom of a, of a macadamia tree. Um, so if they've seen the rats there, the best location is to go and put the trap straight away into that location. What we know is that by the time they've actually got to that hot spot that they're going to, chances are they've already found what they're looking for. So it's actually a little bit late. It's like uh, we're going up to our favorite restaurant and someone on the side is trying to offer us uh, a hot dog. Whereas we're like, no, I'm already, I'm already going to my favorite location here. So what we're trying to do is do things a little bit differently. And these here um, pre-feed with the lure that's in the, uh, the paste that's actually in the, the trap itself. Um, and in, in doing that, you start finding out the locations that the, the rats are prepared to stop and actually interact with the, with the, the pace that we're using. Mm-hmm. And that might, sometimes it's, n- it's not actually at the very hot spot you're trying to protect. It might be 10, 15, 20 metres away where you're, they're actually more prepared to stop and, and, and engage with it. We also know, I guess, from our conservation routes that um, rats and mice will travel on these invisible pheromone trails. If there were... If you're in a, in a barn shed, for example, and they're all coming in, they're all more than likely will be coming in through one corner or through the same corner and following the same pathway down and then going along the same wall because they're just following through the urine sense that they, they know in those pheromone trails, this is a safe pathway for them to travel on. So of course, getting the trap in the right place is often the most important part of that as well. So there's no point having one on the other wall if they're never actually going to go past it. So inside, outside, these become a really important tool to actually ensure that you're getting the the trap in the right place, the location that they feel safe, that's on these highways that they travel, um, and in a position that they're ready to actually engage with that very pace. You then take those away. Once you start getting nibbles on the the card itself, you'll see pretty significant true marks that tells you you're in the right place. And then you take these away, replace that with the trap, which has the same lure attractant in it as well. And it's in a place, you know, is a good spot for them. And then they, uh, that's when they just go looking for it the next day on that pathway and they go into the trap. Um, and that often just creates a bit of a, you're then in, in the right place. Well, thank you for that explanation. Do you have any um, specific customer success stories you'd like to share, either you or Jeff? Yeah, I mean, we've got so many different use cases for us where it's been a fascinating journey, as you can imagine, a conservation tool in which we've done all sorts of uh, great things um, locally and also more so domestic, uh, globally now as well. Um, we were starting to put large amounts of these traps out um, in a place in, in New Zealand and uh, um, Taranaki Moanga. They had 2,000 of these traps go out into large scale. Um, and when you start putting them out in this uh, a large density, you do it more around the what you leave behind rather than what you are killing. So it's a, you measure it by a tracking rate. Um, and I guess we know that we've had a lot of success in, in doing that to get it down to below 5%, which is a, a time you can introduce, reintroduce uh, native wildlife and bird species. Um, and I guess from that, we've also then as we've talked to, evolved into these other opportunities, for example, in, in rural, we know we solve a problem there, um, of which we've got countless examples of where we've solved it, you know, uh, people from wanting to put a grid network over their whole farm, going around a large perimeter around the outside of their fences, essentially creating sanctuaries from the outside in. So rather than having it just on the hot spot, if you were to imagine an outside perimeter around on your, your main fence line, which can be really large sometimes, just having that constant control um, from all sides is, is a good way to stop the species getting in in the very first place the lights of uh so substations and, and grain silos where um you know food becomes a as as a challenge as well and obviously you don't want to be the use of toxin there is isn't as effective um and comes with its own challenges around food 
Um, substations, so we have power stations over here where uh, we're doing a, a deal, a, an agreement with someone called Transpower. We have a lot of substations across New Zealand, which are unmanned and un, un, um, no one's actually looking after those as well. So for them, we solve the problem we solve there is that they don't want to, they want to have a track that's constantly available um, that can kill again and again, because if anything comes in, they want to get it right there and then. They don't want to use toxins because uh, of the risk that if a, a rat comes on into that area, it eats the, the poison. It's still got that 24 to 48 hours before it dies, and it can still actually then cause the damage to the wires that the actual power station is trying is really trying to prevent because that can be a serious issue for them as well. So they're saying, well, I, I can't be there constantly to rearm a, a manual trap. I can't, it's too much risk for us to have to not have an immediate death as well through using um, poison. So the best way for us to have something that self resets is constantly available and uh, and yeah and gets that kills them immediately as well. So yeah, we've got lots of those different um, case studies, I guess, and examples of where we've used uh, we've become a relative um, relevant application, which is cool. Well, I I'm finding this very interesting and have appreciated all the both of you have had to offer today. Do either of you have any final thoughts or anything you'd like to add before we wrap up? Yeah, just one thing, when you look at good nature and the product that they've developed, they've really kind of revolutionized, um, you know, the, the the traps because you have your traditional snap traps, you have your electric traps and glue traps and bait and poison. And then if you like look across those to see like which ones are toxic and not toxic, which ones are humane, which ones are pet safe, do they have multiple kills or do you have to reset them daily? Uh, can you use them outdoors? Uh, how much daily maintenance do they require? It's kind of cool to see their product because I didn't know a lot about it. Uh, you know, rat and mice before that, but um, looking at their product, what's what's really neat is they solve all those. So, you know, they're non-toxic, they're humane, they're pet safe, which is a big thing, especially on farms when you have other cat and mouse, uh, um, excuse me, other cat and dogs uh, around the farm. Um, they have multiple kills and then um, outdoors, and then they, they don't require daily maintenance. So they kind of check all the boxes, which is really neat. Well, awesome. Adam, do you have any final thoughts? No, I think much, much the same. Yeah, like we're really excited to be having this conversation um, and I'm really excited to be working obviously in partnership with, with Gallagher and, uh, and yeah, being leaders of, of, of having an open discussion around how pest control can be done um, in a rural setting and on farms. Um, and, you know, it's something we've learned a lot about over the years and understand that problem that we solve. And I think now that we have a partner like Gallagher, we're, we're ready to have it in, in a much deeper way as well. So, yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us. Well, thank you both. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Bye. And... That's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.